to be anything or accomplish anything for, for you to receive His love, that, that we get that unconditionally. But that's what makes us a Christian. We're not a Christian because we have certain morals or we do certain things. Well, we're a Christian because Jesus has loved us abundantly and that we know that love and get to live in that love. But yet the reality is there's, there's people in our lives that don't know the same hope that we have. They don't have the same grace that, that we know and love. And so we get to join Jesus in, in helping those people to understand that grace and love that we know so well. And so that's what we get to do as we join Jesus. We get to have relationships with people. Let Jesus do the complicated stuff and we get to do the simple fact of talking about him in relationship. Let's pray and then we're going to dive into talking about what we're talking about today. Uh, Dear Jesus, we just pray that you'd work in our hearts and minds. We just pray that you'd speak to us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed in life that there's some things that are really hard to forget about? Like nobody gets to the end of the day and they're like, oh, I forgot to drink coffee today. Like it doesn't happen. If you're a coffee drinker, the first thing you do is you make that pot of coffee, that cup of coffee. There's some things in life that you don't forget about. If you're anything like me, it's really hard for me to forget to check Facebook or social media. Like I'll I'll get my phone out in the morning to like check the weather and like without even thinking, I just like hit Facebook. Do you ever do that? Like, it's really hard not to check Facebook. Like, if you're addicted to it, like I am, like, try not to check it for a few days and see how it goes. There's some things that are really hard not to do, like filling your car up with gas. Now, now maybe you're one of those people that, like, you get to halfway, and you're, like, going to the gas station. I'm not. I'm the type of person that I wait till the warning light comes on. Then I go fill it up. But it's really hard to forget, right? Because the light starts screaming at you. It starts yelling at you to go fill up your car. So it makes it really hard to forget to fill your car up with gas. There's some things in life that are really hard to forget about. But if that's true, the opposite's true. There's some things in life that are really easy to forget about. There's some things in life that are really easy not to do. I truly believe that sharing your faith or evangelism is one of the easiest things not to do. There's a lot of reasons for that. That that we're busy. All of us have multiple and many things to do in our life. We're busy with kids. We're busy with family. We're busy with aging relatives. Many of us are busy in our lives, and so it's really easy not to take that time to be that neighborhood missionary, not to share Jesus with those who surround us. Evangelism is the easiest thing not to do. That's why we believe really strongly that these five questions are really helpful. We'll talk about these this week and next week. And and these five questions are really um, helpful because they get us in the right position, the right mindset, the right place to to be able to hear what Jesus wants us to do and to join Him in in what He's up to. Because being in the right position is really, really critical. So I ran track in high school. I wasn't a sprinter. Uh, But anybody, is anybody a sprinter? Anybody sprinted in high school, in college, whatever? Um, yeah, some of you do. And, and I find sprinting kind of annoying, if I'm going to be honest. And the annoying part about it is, is, well, when you run distance, you basically go on the track, and like five seconds later, you start and you run. But if you're a sprinter, it's the exact opposite. You've got to grab your blocks. That's what those are. And then you got to take like 10 minutes to get your blocks in the right space. You either like grab a tape measure out or you like count with your feet and do like three full steps and like a half step. Whatever it is, you have your like specific way of putting those blocks at the exact right place. And it takes forever. Then you got to make sure the blocks are actually on the right place on the stand. Then you got to stretch off the blocks and then you stretch on the blocks. And how is it that like the fastest sprinter like always gets to stretch for the longest amount of time. Like you know before the race starts who's going to win. It's the person who stretches the longest. Like just FYI, that's how it works. It's like the unwritten rule. But then finally, after they spend all this time getting into the right position, like they finally run the race and it's over in like, I don't know, 10 to 15 seconds. 
right? It, it takes forever to get in the right position, and then you finally run. But see, if you know anything about sprinting, you know that that is imperative for success. In fact, if you don't set your blocks right, you can lose the race before it even begins. If you're not in the right stance when the gun goes off, you are done. Being in that right position is really critical. And we believe it's the same thing for joining Jesus. That we believe that joining Jesus is really, really simple. It's you having relationships with people that don't know Jesus and looking for opportunities to share Jesus. Letting God do the complicated, you do the simple. That's joining Jesus. It's really simple. But what so often happens is because we're not in the right position, the right posture, the right stance, we do the easy thing and end up just not doing evangelism, not sharing our faith. Now, now let's remember, um, Proverbs 16, 9, it says, the, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And it's, it's God who helps us. It's God who puts us in the right position. But we are called to, to recognize what's going on with that. So, so just Saturday night, um, I wasn't planning on this being a part of the sermon, it's bonus material for you, but Saturday night we had a couple who walked to our Saturday night service um, from their house, and, and as they were walking, they were walking click, quickly to get to church, and this other couple they walked by was walking a little slower, and they said, uh, the couple mentioned, hey, you're walking really fast, and the couple's like, yeah, we are, we're going to church. And they just kind of talked to him for a minute and then went to church. That couple ended up following our members to church last night. That they were here. Right now, now again, like only Jesus could have orchestrated that. But see, what they did is, is they recognized that Jesus was working in their life. And, and they didn't, hey, hey, you should go to church with us. They didn't hand them a pamphlet. They just simply lived their life. And when they had the opportunity to say what they were doing, they said it boldly and courageously. We're going to church. Now, I don't know why that visiting couple was here, but I'm sure God had a reason for it. And he used that couple, one of our members, to, to bring them into God's house um, last night. And that's what we're called to do. We can plan, we can get in the right position, but it's God who works. And we believe these five questions, they help you get into that right position so you can pay attention to what Jesus is doing around you. And so we'll talk about questions one and two in depth today, but I just want to go through all five of these quick. How did you see God at work this week? Number two is, what has God been teaching you in his word? Number three is, what kind of conversations are you having with pre-Christians? We, we consider a pre-Christian anyone who's far from the grace and truth of Jesus, but you're in their life. We would call that a pre-Christian because it's only a matter of time before God works in their life and brings them to faith. And that's God's job. Our job is to just have the relationship. Um, number four, what good can we do around here? How do you get to serve people and love people and encourage people and have relationships with people? And number five, how can we help you in prayer? Those are the five questions that, that we want you to think about and talk about. Uh, many of our small groups are going to begin to talk about those questions as just a little part of their small group, and we want to encourage you in that, that you're having conversations with people in your life based on these five questions. So let's dive deeper just into two of them. Um, so the first we want to ask you, we want to ask this question, how did you see God at work this week? It's not how did you see God at your employment this week, but how did you see God working and active and doing things in your life? How did you see God at work this week? See, I think a lot of times like, we notice like, really big miracles in life. So like, if you're in a car wreck and you walk away with just a scratch, you might say things like, I saw a miracle, I saw God working. Or, or if you had a family member who was sick and they suddenly got healthy, you might talk about that as God working. But I think sometimes God does some of his greatest work through really simple things. Uh, so I watched a show growing up, it's called Jonah of Arcadia. Any, anybody watch that show? Anybody? Um, it was on for like, I think, one and a half seasons probably because like I was the only person in America that watched it. Um, that's probably why. Um, not super popular, but, but in that show, um, there, there's this um, episode, and basically it's a show where God appears to this girl named Joan and tells her that he's God, and then kind of gives her little things to do that end up helping people and making the world better. Um, so really cool premise, but, but God's trying to convince Joan at the start of the episode that he's actually God. 
So Joan's in high school, and God appears as a really cute high school boy, so she's interested in talking to him. But then God explains that he's God. Now, now just FYI, high school girls, like, sometimes boys try to convince you of that. Don't listen to them. They're not God. Okay, let's just throw that out there. Dads, you can thank me for helping you later. Um, so, but, but anyway, uh, God, Joan asks God for a sign. He asks, she asks God for a sign. And you, like, think this big thing's going to get ready to happen, but it doesn't. God simply points at a tree and says, there's my sign. That tree, that's the miracle. That's the sign you want, is, is that tree. You look at it right there. Now, now, it's kind of anticlimactic, right? Because it's like we see trees every day. Even in Colorado, there's tons and tons and tons of trees. But I think the point is really important here. That a lot of times, like, we miss the minor miracles. We, we, we miss the minor things that God does, but those things are really vital, that God works sometimes through just little ordinary things that we might not call miracles, but they are. So this is kind of how I've seen God working in my life this week, one of the ways. Um, so so I'm kinda, I kind of mentioned this before, but I'm a little addicted to my cell phone. Like it's kind of an issue I have that I'm working through. Uh, but, but it is kind of one of those things that I have. So I was, playing on my son, I was playing on the floor with my son the other day with Caleb. Um, and he's playing with me and then he kind of goes away to play with something different. So what do I do? Like without even thinking, I just like pull out my cell phone and start scrolling through. Um, and then a second later, Caleb comes over to me and he says, Daddy, stop texting. <laughs> now, now like I could easily like explain this away. I could say, well, he's just being a, two, a selfish two and a half year old. He just doesn't want me on his phone so that I'm not ignoring him. He wants all the attention. Like I could explain it away. But I think the reality is this. I think it was God's reminder to me through my two and a half year old son to, to live in the moment, to, to pay attention to my kids who aren't going to be a lot or aren't going to be in my house forever. And so we get those reminders, and I believe that that's God's working, that he can do those things, that God is big enough that he can even work through my two-and-a-half-year-old son. And we need to pay attention to what God is up to, like the, the reason you have a relationship with that neighbor that lives across the street. And when you see some brokenness or distress in her life, when she seems to be going through something, that's God working in that relationship you have with her to invite you to draw near to her in relationship. I believe that's God's working, and we have to pay attention to those things. If we get to join Jesus, then we need to pay attention. We need to seek, recognize, and respond to what he's up to. And so we want to ask you that question. We want to ask you, what is Jesus up to in your life? Where do you see him working? And then again, we always want to put that question with this question. What has God been teaching you in his word? Because that's how we make sure that we're actually following God and what we're hearing and thinking we're seeing and thinking we're hearing is actually from God that we always bring it back to his word. And so we want to ask you, what has God been teaching you in his word, in the scriptures? So I went skydiving uh, one time, and that's not me, but I probably looked that awesome when I jumped out of the plane. Um, just, just saying. Um, but, but I went skydiving with my friend Viren, and I've talked about Viren uh, before. But Viren and I, uh, we jumped out of the plane, and, and so we got to do a cool type of skydiving where the plane actually pulls your chute. And so if you skydive like that, you don't get quite the same free fall that you do if you do a tandem jump and you like ride with somebody who's experienced. But the cool part about it, when you do a plane pole jump, you jump out of the plane, but then you, by yourself, after like half a day of training, you get to kind of guide yourself down to the landing place. And one of the key parts about this is actually pretty easy. But one of the really important parts uh, about um, guiding yourself down to the ground is actually how you hit the ground. Because even though you have a parachute on, um, you come down to the ground fairly fast. So there's a skill they teach you called a stall technique. And what a stall technique is, is it basically stalls your parachute out so that you kind of float down nice and gracefully to the ground. And so they teach you how to do a stall technique. On a parachute, there's two brakes. And you control the brakes with your hands. And so when your hands are all the way up, the brakes are completely out and you fall as fast as you can. When you put your hands down, the brakes come on. And so they teach you the stall technique, which is basically when you're 60 feet above the ground, you open your brakes completely up so you fall as fast as you can. And then when you're at 30 feet, you close your brakes, and it actually it stalls the parachute. Stalls the parachute. So I came down perfectly. I came down just gracefully, and I'm sure it just looked really good. Um, so Severin came after me. 
And again, you know how to do this because, again, you're parachuting. It's hard to judge what the distance to the ground is, but there's somebody on the ground that's telling you how high up in the air you are. And so you basically just listen to that person. They're in the ear. They can talk to you. And you basically just listen to him. And so Viren's coming down, and he tells him to open up the brakes. So Viren, Viren puts his hands all the way up. He's at 60 feet. And then he gets down to 30 feet, and the guy tells him, stall, stall, break, break. But Viren's not listening. So he's yelling at him, and we can hear him, stall, stall, break, break. But he doesn't, and smack. Viren hits the ground, not gracefully, by the way. He ends up breaking his arm, needing surgery. Why? He didn't listen. He had somebody there telling him exactly what to do, and he didn't listen. I think it's the same for us as Christians. Like we're called to listen to Jesus. Not just every once in a while, but continually. We're called to open up his word and and see what he has to tell us, see what he has to teach us. That's what God wants us to do is to listen to him. And in fact, God says so in Matthew 17 at the mountain of transfiguration when Jesus sees Moses and Elijah when when he's kind of the the veil of, of his glory is taken off and disciples see who Jesus is fully. And God says this about Jesus. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And here it is. Listen to him. That's what God says about Jesus, listen to him, and that's our call in our lives, to listen to Jesus. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. So God says, listen to Jesus, and Jesus' words to his disciples are, have no fear. So what did the disciples do? Well, they rise. They follow Jesus on his ministry. They see Jesus die on the cross. And then without fear, the disciples proclaim this message of salvation to the world. And so we are Christians in part because the disciples did what God asked them to do and shared their faith. Big things happen when we listen to Jesus. And that's our call in life, is to listen to the things that he has to tell us, that he has to show us. So again, we ask the question regularly, what is Jesus teaching you in his word? So let's practice that just for a minute. This is a verse that really stood out to me this week as I was reading and hearing from Jesus. Jesus in John 4, he says this, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. I think that's a cool passage. Because we as Christians, we talk a lot about being fed. We can talk about being fed in communion that we get to receive Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We talk about being fed in worship, that the music feeds us. We talk about being fed in God's word, which is true as well. And all of these things, they feed us. They give us the strength to live our Christian life. But Jesus is saying something a little different here, isn't he? He's saying, my food is to do the will of God. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever heard that before? I don't know that I have, but that my food, that our food, that we actually get fed by, yes, God's grace, his love, his forgiveness, but we also, in a way that we can't fully understand, we get fed by doing the will of God, that we get fed by talking about Jesus, that when you share the gospel of Jesus with somebody, that that feeds you. Now, maybe the best way to understand that is to think about um, teachers will tell you this. They tell you you don't really understand something until you teach it to somebody else. What if we fully understand the gospel in the best way when we get to share that gospel with somebody else? It's worth thinking about. It seems like Jesus' words kind of push us that way. But we want you to think about that. What is Jesus revealing you to you in his word? What is he teaching you? And again, that's why we go through the five questions, because we want to get you in the right position, the right starting location, in order that you might join Jesus. So here's your challenge this week. Um, Try this. Pray through the five questions every day this week. Pray through them. They're in your book. I believe they're in the last chapter. You can find them there. But pray through them every day this week. If you need to write them down or take a picture of that, you're welcome to do that. The other option is I think we still have some coasters out there. If you want to grab them, they're on the welcome counter out there. You can grab one of those coasters and take them home. But just simply pray through those questions today. 
Because we believe they get us in the right position, the right posture to join Jesus in what he's up to. But that starting location is really, really key. So take some time to do that, to pray through them this week, to get them on your heart and mind. So, so I want to end with this, because I think some of us, like, we, we hear this joining Jesus, and it really builds us up, it empowers us, it gets us excited. Um, some of us, though, this is challenging stuff. And we can easily like hear it and feel like we're a failure, feel like we've messed up, feel like we're not good enough for Jesus' love, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. That couldn't be absolutely farther from the truth. So, so I'm a parent, many of you know, I talk about my kids probably way too much, um, but that, that's okay. Uh, but my kids, I love when they do things that I like. It's just awesome. So my, my little daughter, Cora, uh, she's crawling now. Um, and so when I get home, when I open the garage door and then open the door into the house, she comes scurrying over. She crawls right over to me. And then she'll pull up on me and, like, give me a hug. Like, it's, like, wonderful to have your eight-month-old give you a hug. Like, it's just awesome. And my kids do things like that. They do things that just make, make my heart glow, make me really happy and excited. But you know what? Other days, they do things that bother me. They don't always sleep. They don't always eat. They, they hardly listen. But you know what? I love them just as much when they give me the hug as I do when they disobey me. Now, I might not feel so good inside when they disobey me, but I love them the same amount. And so some of you, some of you are just doing really well at this joining Jesus thing. Like it is in your wheelhouse. You're just loving it and eating it up. You know what? If that's you, God loves you. He cares deeply for you. If you find yourself struggling in this idea, this notion of joining Jesus, you find yourself failing and doing the wrong things, you know what? God loves you just as much as that other person. Because our ability to make God love us doesn't exist. Did you know that? That you don't have an ability to make God love you more or less. God loves you the same exact amount no matter what because that's the love of a perfect parent that our Heavenly Father is. He loves you just as much no matter what you do. And that's the love of God that we get to share with the world. Will you take some time uh, to join me in prayer? Dear Jesus, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that we are your children, and we thank you for everything that means. That we get the freedom and opportunity to live our lives and attempt to live our lives glorifying you. But we can rest assured that you love us no matter what. No matter our faults or failures, no matter our issues or struggles, you love us deeply and abundantly. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to be people of love. That when people come in the doors of our church, that they might feel the love, first and foremost, of you, but also that they might feel the love that we share with them that comes from you. The Heavenly Father, just help this to be a place of community and belonging, a place of love and friendship and relationships. The Heavenly Father, just work in us to make us a people of your love. The Heavenly Father, be with all the equipping that we do as we seek to disciple and build people up. As we teach our Sunday school kids, our confirmation kids, our adult Bible studies, as we meet for small groups to be equipped in your love. Tell me, Father, we thank you for our school that equips all our students in Jesus' love. We thank you for that we are a place that does that regularly and intentionally. And just help us to excel at that. <clears throat> but dear Heavenly Father, help us to, peep, to, peep, to be people that see the church not as this place, but the church is everywhere we go. And just allow us to join you in sharing our faith with people and relationships. Build us up in that and encourage us in that. The Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us be attentive to your promptings this week. As we seek where you are at work and respond as, you, as your followers. We pray for safe travel and learning and renewal for our church and school staff as they attend the District Church Workers Conference this week. We pray for all families who are traveling as some of them are on school break this week. 
To Heavenly Father, we, we pray for all the volunteers and resources for our community fall festival coming up at the end of the month. We pray that you would bless that and just give us a great opportunity to be neighbors to people in our community, that we might have relationships and might get the chance to share our faith with them. To Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who are sick and ill, those who are in this building, those who are on our hearts and minds, those throughout the world that we may not know about. Just help us give them hope and comfort. Help them, us to love them in the midst of their situation. To Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear us. We know that you always hear us. But we especially ask that you would hear us now as we pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 